Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the First United Methodist Church here in Kewanee, Illinois. It's always great to stand up here and see your bright and smiling faces, so just keep those smiles going because they're awesome. Praise God. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Amen. My name is Donna Boardman, and I'm the lay leader of our congregation. And I would also like to thank the visitors who are here today. We do hope that you'll take a moment to step downstairs after worship and enjoy some refreshments with us. We have coffee and punch and all kinds of goodies. So please join us. This is Pastor Kevin Drain, who will be leading our worship today. He's our new awesome pastor. We have a few announcements I'd like to share with you. We're going to have a noisy offering today, so look for the little buckets. That's where we collect noisy offering money. And this one will be for the Christmas Mission Fund, so please give generously as you feel led. The children will be reporting to the Narthex after the offering today and will be taken to the classroom, their classroom for Children's Church. Oh, today's communion, though. Are we still doing that? It is. Okay. World Communion Sunday. World Communion Day today. Yes, we also are willing to accept good funds for World Communion offering today, which will go out throughout the world to, to help those. Okay, Martin says he's going to talk about that during children's message. So the children will not be exiting today. They'll be coming up here for children's message because it's communion day. Okay, the crop hunger walk is today also. Wow, that came up fast. Today, October 6th. And... Um, there's other various announcements in your bulletin. For those of you who are here, just take a moment to read those as well. We do have a couple of other brief ones. Um, the office would like you to know that they need to have your name turned in by October 15th if you want envelopes for offerings. This year, we've just decided to do on a voluntary basis. If you do not want offering envelopes, then you do not have to do anything. But if you do want offering em envelopes and you're not giving your dollars, you know, directly to the bank, then please contact the office and give them your name so that they can put you down. The worship team is going to be meeting October 8th at 6 p.m. in the workroom. So those of you on worship team, see you there. And also we have um, in your bulletins a prayer. We're looking for members who would like to join the prayer chain. If you're interested in that and you're not already on our prayer chain, fill this out, turn it into the office, and we'll get you signed up. God bless you all. Have a wonderful day. You know, the other thing we might consider doing with the uh, prayer chain brochure, I would hope that uh, you might consider being a part of the prayer chain. From time to time, we have things come up that we want to inform the congregation about. If you've signed up, then you'll get an email. Um, and eventually, uh, perhaps even a text message, if that's the way you would like it. Um, folks to pray for. But you know what? The other thing that you could do with this, if, as you fill it out, or if you just want us or me uh, to pray about something for you, jot a note on there, and we would be delighted to, to accept uh, prayer requests as well. With that, welcome to Kiwani First United Methodist Church. Let us pass the peace of Christ to one another. As you remain standing, please turn to hymn number 357, Just As I Am. 
We'll be singing verses 1, 2, 3, and 6. We have an opportunity now to continue our worship as we pray to our God. You know, we have a God who wants to know your joys as well as your concerns. We have a God who is available to you 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. That's pretty awesome, don't you think? Yeah, it is. Thank you, God. You know, today I'm going to uh, include you, if you don't mind. Um, I'll pray, but then I'll say, uh, Lord, in your mercy, and I would like you to respond. Hear our prayers. You are a sharp group. It's almost like you've heard this before, huh? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And our tradition here at First United Methodist of Kiwani is that at the conclusion of our prayer time, then together we recite the Lord's Prayer. It's number 895 in your hymnal. It's also included in your bulletin. Let's go to the Lord. Our Lord and our God, we're just humbled that we can come before your throne that you are ever more ready to hear than we are to pray, God. Why you are mindful of us as human beings is a mystery, and yet, God, we thank you. We thank you for the love, the grace, and the mercy that you pour out on us each and every day. Oh, how we need your grace. We need your love. We come before you this morning, Lord. Our first thought is that our worship would be pleasing to you. This morning isn't about us. It's about us coming together and bringing you praise and honor and glory, Lord. That's our desire. Holy Spirit, fill each and every one of us. Fill this place, fill our community, and yes, our world. Lord, in your mercy. 
Lord, we know you to be a healing God. We know that we have brothers and sisters and neighbors and family and folks who are in need of your physical touch. Your word says you are the great physician. Lord, we just pray for those who are struggling physically. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we also pray for those who perhaps their brokenness isn't physical but emotional. Lord, we pray for those who struggle with anxiety or depression or addictions, Lord. For those who struggle emotionally, Lord. We lift them up to you. We place them upon your altar. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, the busyness of this world oftentimes seems to uh, erode our spirit. And so, God, we know you to be a spiritually healing God as well. Help us to find those times of Sabbath in our busy, busy lives. Help us to just be still and know you are God. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we thank you for the ability to worship on this day. We thank you, Jesus, for the atoning action of the cross. We thank you for the love, God, that you have for the world. So much love that you gave your only son. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for the way you coach and counsel and guide us protect us. Lord, we have men and women in this world who are your healing hands, who are your protecting hands. We lift all those folks up who are first responders. We pray for those who who are teachers and administrators in our schools. Lord, for all those who have a ministry, a calling in their vocation. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, thank you. Thank you for loving us. We now pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
If the children would come forward, we'll have our children's chat. Pastor Martin is ready and willing. Come on, man. I said ready and good looking. Is that what I heard? I didn't quite hear what he said. I thought he said good looking. It's probably true. Any children here today? Big kids can come up too if you want to. You'll get something worthwhile, I guarantee it. stand up for this time because that makes it easier if I sit down it would take a long time for me to get back up again all right hello so second Corinthians 9 7 says each must do as they have decided in their heart not reluctantly or from compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver that's second Corinthians 9 7 that's a lot to memorize isn't it Let's do just the last part. God loves a cheerful giver. Can you say that with me? God loves a cheerful giver. All right. Well, I'm going to tell you a story from almost 50 years ago. A friend of mine named Tom was a pastor of a church, just like Pastor Kevin or like me. And Tom had a son named Shad. And Shad was about your age right there. How old were you? Six. Six? Yep, he was about that age. And uh, every Sunday, Tom would give Shad a quarter, just like this. There you go. You want one? There you go. How about you? You want one? You? You didn't come up. You didn't come up. There you go. Every Sunday, Tom would give Shad a quarter. Shad, like Shadrach in the Bible, is where his name came from. And uh, Shad was supposed to put the quarter in the offering plate. Well, one Sunday after church, after Pastor Tom had shook hands with everybody, he looked over at Shad, and Shad had his hand just like this. And Tom said, Shad, what's in your hand? He just looked around and didn't say anything. Tom said, Shad, open your hand. There was the quarter in his hand. He said, how come you didn't put the quarter in the offering? He said, I wanted to buy an ice cream cone. This is a long time ago. You could buy an ice cream cone for a quarter. <laughs> so Tom had a long talk with Shad. The next Sunday came. Tom said, now, Shad, are you going to put your quarter in the offering? Oh, yes. And Shad put his quarter in the offering. The next Sunday, they had a guest speaker. And Shad was still upset about it. And so when it came time for the offering, the ushers came forward, they began to take the offering, and Shad stood up and said, if you put your money in that plate, you're just throwing it away. That would have been okay, because the people at Rio Rancho Church in Albuquerque, New Mexico, would have heard that. But on that particular Sunday, it was charged Conference Sunday. So who do you think was sitting next to Pastor Tom, the district superintendent? And the district superintendent looked over at Tom and began to write some things down, like maybe where Tom was moving or something. <laughs> but what he actually was writing was he was a writer for uh, a publication at the time called The Methodist Reporter. And he began to write an article every month called Where Does Your Money Go? And it was inspired by little Shad Strang. So that's the story. Any of it. I guess I didn't. Okay, so now I have a little visual demonstration for you. And you folks won't be able to see this, but it's an ice cube tray. And it is, I, I tinted the water blue with some food coloring. And you'll have to stand up to see this part. Okay? That means stand up now. <laughs> and come over here. And I'm going to pour this in the fancy pitcher because that's the way we're supposed to do this. So that way it looks fancy. And I have this on this tray so it doesn't spill on the carpet. You set that down right there. Now, I'm going to fill this ice cube tray, but not all the way. Okay? I'm going to fill all of these except two. Okay? 
okay. And we're going to keep on going back like this. Fill all of these up just like this. There we go. Okay. Now, would you agree that those are all full? All right. Now, what does it mean to be generous, huh? Now, watch this. These are empty. They have nothing, don't they? These have plenty. Watch what happens when you tilt this just like this. Now, are they all full? They're all full. And yet, the ones who have nothing now have something. Okay, you can sit back down for a second. So, we're going to talk about offering for a minute. Now, today is World Communion Sunday. That means we have communion. It means that people all over the world have communion with us. Same time, they actually started yesterday for us, uh, which like in Australia and stuff is today. And that makes sense, I don't know what that's what it is. But uh, all around the world, people have been taking an offering for World Communion. And the offering goes to help people become pastors in places where they have no money and nothing and start little churches. And I know of a place in Africa where they have a church, just a tin shed. That's all it is. It's a 20 by 14 tin shed. That's church. Okay? And those pastors need books and things like that. And uh, so this World Communion offering goes to that. Now, you have a choice to make. Each of you has a quarter. You can keep it or you can put it in the offering. Okay? And uh, remember, we'll go through our scripture again and we learn. 2 Corinthians 9 7. Say it with me. 2 Corinthians 9 7. God loves a cheerful giver. And where's it at? 2 Corinthians 9 7. That's right. Okay. So off you go. Go out, you can put in the offering, you can keep it either way. It's up to you. And have a good day. Now I'm going to carry this tray out without spilling it. Okay, there you go. And for the rest of you, that was 2 Corinthians 9 7. And say it with me God loves a cheerful giver. You know, uh, World Communion Sunday actually started in this country in 1933. And it is an annual tradition that we keep. We recognize it on a communion Sunday, the first Sunday in October. And so as we observe our Holy Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, the sacrament of Holy Communion, just know that uh, there are many, many, many across the world in unity with us. Not just as Methodists, but as Christians. Amen. through chapter 3 verse 5 in that day declares the Lord you will call me my husband you will no longer call me my master I, I will remove the names of the veils from her lips no longer will their names be invoked in that day I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and the birds of the air and the creatures that move along the ground bow and sword in battle I will abolish from the land so that all may lie down in safety I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge the Lord. In that day, I will respond, declares the Lord. I will respond to the skies, and they will respond to the earth. And the earth will respond to the grain, the new wine and oil, and they will respond to Jezreel. I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I called, not my loved one. I will say to those called, not my people, you are my people. And they will say, You are my God. The Lord said to me, Go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. So I bought her for fifteen shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethic of barley. Then I told her, You are to live with me many days. Well, in 1893, an engineer named George Ferris built a machine that bears his name, the Ferris wheel. Where did it, uh, where was it constructed? Chicago. 
at the World's Exposition, absolutely, in 1893. Well, they call Chicago the Windy City, if I'm not mistaken, and on that July day when the work was completed, George Ferris, his wife, and a reporter, even though Chicago was experiencing one of, the, one of those hat-blowing-off days, took the inaugural ride on the Ferris wheel. After one revolution, Ferris called for the machine to be stopped so that he and his wife and the reporter could step out. Now think about it. The wind is blowing pretty stiff in Chicago. No one has ever ridden one of these contraptions before because this was the first. Each occupant, occupant had demonstrated a bit of faith. Think about it. Mr. Ferris had faith in scientific knowledge and engineering that it would work and it would be safe. Mrs. Ferris and the reporter believed the machine would work on the basis of what the inventor said. Mr. Ferris. They had faith in George as a builder and inventor. But only after the ride could they say that they had an experiential faith. Because after they had had that first ride, now they had experienced that this works. Not only was it fun, but it was safe. And we're back on the ground. Today we're going to talk a little bit about faith and unfaithfulness as we heard in our scripture. Think about all the things that we can be faithful or unfaithful to. You could be faithful to your spouse or unfaithful. You could be faithful to your country or unfaithful. You could be faithful to your church, to your brothers and sisters, your brothers and sisters in Christ. You could be faithful or unfaithful to the Chicago Cubs. Or the White Sox. And I would say the Cardinals, but someone would stand up and go, Heresy! Heresy! Right? There are many, many, many things. A plethora of things that we can be faithful or unfaithful to. Augustine defined faith this way. Augustine said, Faith is to believe in what we do not see. Faith is to believe in what we do not see. And the reward of that faith is to see what we believe. I like that. I like that quote. Thomas Carlyle put it this way, A man lives by believing something. A man or a woman lives by believing something. Not by debating and arguing over many things. All of us have things that we believe in. They make up who we are, those beliefs, what we put our faith in. Well, we're going to look at the book of Hosea today. Let me give you some context. <clears throat> God led the Hebrew people out of Egypt. Y'all remember that story, right? Moses led the people out of Egypt. And God said, you're going to be my people and I'm going to be your God. He had a covenant with these people. You'll be my people, I'll be your God. What God wanted is he wanted their, their love, their admiration, their worship. As they moved into the promised land that God gave them, there were cultures, there were others living around them. And they had gods that they worshipped. And the people of Israel, the Hebrews, began to look at their worship and their gods, and they began to drift away, didn't they? They drifted away from the God we would know as Yahweh, and they began to pursue other pagan gods. And as they did that, then Israel 
in a way, lost their most favored nation status, didn't they? God lifted his hand of protection off of them from time to time, trying to get their attention, trying to woo them. Perhaps you've been in that situation yourself. Have any of you felt the hand of God when he's wooing you, when he's beckoning you, when he's trying to get you into a loving relationship? Anyone? Yeah. That's what God wants. Well, so God's people, Israel or the Hebrews, were drifting away from worshiping our God. In Hosea chapter 2, verse 16, we see an analogy, if you will, an anecdote, a comparison. God is comparing the people, his chosen people, as well as the country of Israel with the example of an unfaithful spouse. That brings us to our scripture today. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. I will remove the names of the Baals from her lips. No longer will their names be invoked. Think about the culture here at this point in time. You know, you could become married a couple of ways. Um, you could meet someone, fall in love, and your families agree that you should be together. But there were also many arranged marriages. Marriages that were contracted, that, that had financial implications, weren't there? That was where we found ourselves. I think what God is saying here is that I want to be your husband in a loving way, not because of a financial obligation. I want to be your beloved husband, not your master. God wants your love. You realize that, don't you? God wants your love. In fact, so much so that if you recall in the New Testament, they were trying to trick Jesus and they asked him, what's, what's, the, what's the number one law? What's the, the purpose, the big deal, Jesus? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then the second's like it, love your neighbor as yourself. God wants your love. Verse 18, in that day I will make a covenant. A covenant is a what? A contract? It's an agreement? It's a deal, if you will? God is, it's a, it's a holy contract between God and His people. In that day I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and the birds of the air and the creatures that move along the ground, bow and sword. And battle I will abolish from the land, so that all may lie down in safety. God here is in essence saying that, you know, the, the world hasn't turned out, right? This isn't the world you were created for. We have, we have war and we have strife. Even nature is out of balance. And, and my covenant isn't just with you, it's with the world. Because I want everyone to experience my peace. My peace. So that all may lay, lie down in safety. Verse 19, I will betroth you to me forever. Betroth, that's an interesting word. And it was a huge word back then. Because there were several stages of matrimony. If it was a contracted marriage, right? Uh, first there was the deal. There was the negotiation. But the, the largest part in their culture was when the, the couple actually were betrothed to one another. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness and you will acknowledge the Lord. Again, God is looking for a loving relationship. 
Verse 21, in that day I will respond, declares the Lord. I will respond to the skies and they will respond to the earth and the earth will respond to the grain, the new wine and oil. And they will respond to Jezreel. Jezreel was a city. It's referring to, to a community in northern Israel. Saying, I'm making this commitment to you and to nature and, and to this country. Right? Verse 23. I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I called, not my loved one. Now, isn't that an interesting statement? I will show my love to the one I called, not my loved one. Why? Why would God call them not my loved one? Because they were in a loving relationship and those people were unfaithful to God and they went and they worshipped pagan gods, right? And at that point in time, they would have been categorized as not my loved one. They love another. I will say to those called not my people, you are my people. And they will say, and you are my God. I'm going to love you. Even if you're unlovable. Any of you ever get in that place where you're unlovable? Fortunately, my wife is in Wisconsin with grandchildren today, so we won't hear the amen out of the back. I mean, we all have our moments, don't we? Any of you have those moments when it just seems like, I don't know. Paul said it best in the New Testament when he said, I seem to do those things that I know I shouldn't do, and yet I can't do the things that I know I should. And sometimes I think that's where we all are as human beings. And God is saying, I want to love you, even if you're unlovable. Isn't that massive? Isn't that a good and joyful thing? That we have a God who loves us? You know, it's been said that none are so good they don't need God, and none are so bad that they can't be cleaned up by God. Amen. None are so broken that they can't be healed by our loving, merciful, compassionate God. So here's what Hosea said I want you to do. In chapter 3, verse 1, The Lord said to me, Go show your love to your wife again. God had asked Hosea, as a prophet, to marry a woman of ill repute. Though she is loved by another and is an adulteress, unfaithful, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. Though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. Any of you like raisins? Okay, how many of you don't like raisins? I have found through my life that many are uh, actual fans of raisins and many are not fans of raisins. There's not a huge a lot of, of amount of people in between. I've got to tell you, I love mincemeat pie. And most people are going, Ew, that is disgusting. And yet most mincemeat pies today are truly have turned into raisin pies, haven't they? And there is a difference. Those who love mincemeat, you could say amen. Yep, the three of us should get together and split a pie someday. <laughs> Not that I'm hinting or anything. <laughs> Chapter 3, verse 2. So I bought her, his ex-wife, if you will. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer or a lethic of barley. And then I told her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man, and I will live with you. Verse 4, for the Israelites will live many days without a king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without an ephod or idol. God's saying things are going to change for you. Listen up, folks. 
You've drifted away. You're, you're, you're moving further and further away from the love of your God. And as you do that, and we know time and time again, Israel was actually taken captive. And their captors, Assyrians, um, oftentimes would capture the country and then deport them. You know, if they captured Kiwani, the next thing you know, we're in Canada. And they've moved Canadians here to Kiwani. <laughs> and if you're from Canada, please, no letters about that being exile, all right? But there's the reality. Hosea is saying you're going to be taken captive. God's hand of protection is going to be lifted off of you because you've strayed away from what should have been your first love. But don't worry. Because even though you've been exiled, there's a time when you'll come back. You'll come back to Kiwani or Galva or Toulon or, or wherever you're from, right? Meaning, you'll turn back to God. And I'll be there waiting for you. And each and every one of us, as we read the story in the Bible about the prodigal son, we know that the prodigal is me. I don't know if you're aware of that or not, but that story was written about Kevin Drain. And you. It was written about us. But no matter who we are, where we go, what we do, we have a God who is there saying, I love you. I want you as my son. I want you as my daughter. Come back home. And I'll put a ring on your finger. And a cloak. And sandals. I'll give you what I want you to have. What you should have had all along. Verse 5, afterward the Israelites will return home and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in those last days. The Israelites were God's chosen people. But God also opened things up to Gentiles. Amen? That's a big deal. Because I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm not a Jew. The Jews were God's chosen people, and the rest of the world were called Gentiles. Thank you, God, for bringing us Gentiles into the fold as well. We all have problems staying faithful to God, drifting away from God, worshiping other gods. You know, I love stories. Let me finish with this story. i got to take this home, right? Clarence Jordan. Any of you heard of Clarence Jordan? Clarence Jordan was a gentleman who was, uh, well, he was a smart guy. Unusual abilities and commitment. Clarence Jordan had two PhDs. He had one in agriculture and he had another in Hebrew and Greek. Yeah. I remember Hebrew and Greek in seminary. <laughs> <clears throat> can't imagine a PhD so gifted was he he probably could have done anything he was just one of those people but you know what he chose to do he chose to minister to the poor down south in the 1940s he founded a farm in Americus, Georgia he called the farm Koinonia 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 is a Greek term it means fellowship in fact, when you hear or you read in the second chapter of Acts when it's talking about fellowship in the church, oftentimes the word that's used is koinonia. It's like an anointed bonding together of God's people. And that's what he named his farm, koinonia farm. He started the farming community for poor whites 
might have been referred to as white trash down south. And for blacks. You can imagine how popular that was in 1940s deep south. Ironically, too much of the resistance came from good church people following segregation. People in town tried everything to stop Clarence and his commune, commune if you will. Workers would go into town for supplies and come back to their truck and find the tires slashed. For 14 years they put up with that kind of harassment. And finally in 1954, the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, had said they had enough of Clarence Jordan and his experiment. So they decided to get rid of him once and for all. They came one night with guns and torches. They burnt down every structure on the farm except his residence. And it they riddled with bullets. Their intent was to make sure there was nothing left of Koinonia Farm and in all the families that lived on the farm and were attached to the farm. All of them were driven off that night except one, one black family who said they would not leave. Obviously, while all this was going on, Clarence recognized many of the voices. One voice that he recognized was the local newspaper reporter. Ironically, the next day, the local reporter came to interview Clarence for a story about the tragedy. And as the rubble still smoldered, he found Clarence in the field, hoeing and planting. I heard the awful news, he called out to Clarence. And I came out to do a story on the tragedy of your farm closing. Clarence kept hoeing. The reporter kept prodding and poking, trying to get a rise from this quiet, determined gentleman who seemed to be worried more about planting than packing his bags. So finally the reporter said in a haughty voice, Well, Dr. Jordan, you got two of them PhDs and you put 14 years into this farm and there's nothing left at all. Just how successful would you say you've been? And then Clarence stopped hoeing. And he turned to the reporter with his penetrating eyes and he said quietly but firmly, about as successful as the cross. Sir, I don't think you understand us. What we are about is not success, but faithfulness. Faithfulness. We're staying. Good day. And on that day, Clarence and others who collected began to rebuild Koinonia Farm. And yes, it's still there today. In fact, the gentleman who started the movement, Habitat for Humanity, actually requested to be buried on Koinonia Farm. E. Stanley Jones says this about faith. Faith is not merely your holding on to God. That's part of faith. Faith is when we hold on to God, but the other part of that faith is that God holds on to us and He will not let you go. Amen? Amen. And there's the joy. There's the promise. There's the love that God has for us. Martin Luther put it this way. God our Father has made all things depend on faith so that whoever has faith will have everything. Whoever does not have faith will have nothing. Wow. It's a pretty bold statement. Does that mean we're going to get everything we want? God will give us everything we want. <laughs> Woohoo! No, I think we know that God doesn't give us what we want, but God will 
give us what we need. Thank you, God. Thank you that you're God and you define what I need. And you don't let Kevin Drain decide. Clarence Jordan got more than he bargained for, except he didn't find, define success in a worldly way. It wasn't about more and more acres. It wasn't about more and more money. It wasn't about more and more stuff. It was about being faithful the God he loved. Hosea told us a story today about being faithful to the God who will never let go of you. I suspect that one day Clarence will hear from God, well done, good and faithful servant. Someday I hope to hear that. I think most of us do. In fact, if you also want to hear, well done, good and faithful service, servant, then say, Amen. 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 <laughs> well, what do you want to do now? Good. We could sing a song. We could we could maybe have some communion here together. It is World Communion Sunday. And here are the elements. Can you imagine? Go in a remote, guys. On World Communion Sunday, we come together. with many, many churches. Some churches who yesterday was today, as you referred to. Churches all over the world celebrating this holy sacrament. There are two sacraments in the United Methodist Church. Communion is one of them. Isn't that awesome? Baptism is the other, in case you're wondering. Why did God use such common elements as bread and wine or juice? How many of us don't eat and drink every day, right? And I think that was part of the message God was sending. That he wants us to think about his relationship and our relationship with God each and every day. That night in the upper room, we were observing a Seder meal. And Jesus picked up bread and he gave thanks to you, God. And as he broke that bread, he turned to those in the room and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. And a little later, during the meal, that Seder meal that was very scripted, Tradition tells us it was during the third cup. The third cup of wine that Jesus again deviated from the tradition of the Seder meal. And again he gave thanks to you God and he turned to everyone in the room and he said this. This is the blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Each time you eat the bread or drink from the cup do it in remembrance of me. And so it is that we are here today remembering the mighty acts that Jesus instituted that night in the upper room. The bread, his body given for you. The juice, his blood poured out for you. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we come before you now and we just pray, Lord, that even as we speak, your Holy Spirit is flowing in to these gifts of bread and juice and these wafers, Lord. We pray that as your Holy Spirit fills these elements, I'm not sure we totally understand it, God, 
But our prayer is that you would bless these elements with your spirit. And that as we consume or partake, then we are blessed with your spirit. But that's not the end game. Your desire is for us to be blessed with your spirit and then to be a blessing to the rest of the world. So allow your spirit to flow into these elements and then into us. And so that as we then approach the world around us and everyone in it, that they too would receive your blessing and your spirit. We pray this now in Jesus' holy and righteous name. And all God's people said, Amen. I could have our servers come forward. We will uh, use a method called intinction. You'll have the ability to come forward. Out here, we'll have two lines. The Gutzmers will be on this side, and I'll get to be on the right side today for a change. Out here, we have wafers. The white ones are just ordinary wafers. The darker ones are gluten-free, if you need that. We will have the bread. We will take the bread or your wafer, and you will have the ability to dip into the juice. It's a method called intinction. You're welcome to spend time at our altar if you choose. Our tradition as Methodists is that our table is open open to everyone and if you would like um, you can stay in your seat and just uh, raise a hand a little bit as we conclude and we'll bring the elements to you as well oh taste and see that the Lord is good
And all God's people said, thank you for being patient. I know that the uh, bulletin said just the opposite, that we were going to fill the uh, altars. And, and that was the plan today until Dennis Derrick changed things. And Dennis couldn't be here with us today. And, and you know what? If you're real upset, my guess is his committee has room for you. <laughs> you know how that goes, right? Thank you. Amen. Be still, my soul. Be still. <coughs> well, on this World Communion Sunday, my hope and prayer is that you have been filled with the Holy Spirit and that God has been pleased with our worship, that we have brought him praise and honor and glory. And now, in the name of God the Father, Jesus Christ, his holy and perfect Son, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, let us leave this place taking the Spirit of God, the love of Christ, in the communion of all the saints with us as we go. Go in peace, go in love. Amen. Amen. And amen.